Welcome to On The Way, a podcast about life, but not just any life. It's about life with Jesus. Why do people follow Jesus and how do they get started? And what difference does following Jesus make in their lives? Before Christians had a name, they were known as people of the way, people who followed Jesus' teachings. People have been on the way for nearly 2,000 years now. During the podcast, we explore the ways that people become followers of Jesus and why and what difference following Jesus makes in their lives. On the Way is produced by The Baptist Standard, a donor-supported provider of news, opinion, and resources for living like Jesus. I'm Eric Black, editor of The Baptist Standard. I'm glad you're with us today. We have with us today Jesse Loper. Uh, Jesse and I, we've known each other for, oh man, about 15 or so years. Uh, When my wife and I were in college ministry in New Mexico, Jesse was a student at the University of New Mexico. And so we've known each other since then. And it's great to be able to reconnect uh, with you, Jesse. You've gone uh, in one direction geographically. We've gone in another direction geographically. uh, But yet here we are uh, talking to each other online. So Jesse, thank you for being with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Jesse, you and I have talked a little bit about the podcast and the, the focus questions. How did you become a follower of Jesus and what difference does following Jesus make in your life? So how did you become a follower of Jesus? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I grew up uh, uh, going going to church uh, in, in vitro, right? So I was I was a I was a, a little bitty boy. I uh, grew up going to to church in Oklahoma City, and uh, we went to uh, Olivet Baptist Church. And uh, in fact, uh, it was it was at that little church uh, in in Oklahoma City where where I uh, decided to become a follower of Jesus at a young age. I remember my dad. Uh, he he certainly. Uh, was more concerned about it than than anybody in the sense that uh i was so young and i decided hey dad i want to you know follow jesus uh and uh and i remember having these really long conversations which of course when you are uh six years old and seven years old uh that was the harder part was having to go for these long conversations with your parents about why you want to follow jesus um as opposed to making the decision to follow jesus i think it was part of uh who i was now of course i think uh for me me, as a six and seven year old, uh, people say, you know, hey, did you really understand what that meant? Mm-hmm. And uh, I think the easy answer is no, um, of course not. I would also say that even if I was, you know, 36, would I understand what it meant? The answer would be no, um, right? So I think it's a journey. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of essentially how my journey started, at least, uh, is in uh, a Baptist church in, in Oklahoma City. All right. What were your parents doing at the time? Yeah, so my parents, uh, so my dad is a, is a doctor by training and uh they uh, and he stopped practicing medicine, and uh, when I was six, I think probably around five, four or five years old, and uh, and basically he and my mom became uh, home missionaries uh, with the old home mission board, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, yep. and uh, my dad would day. go around. Yeah, exactly. Back in the day, uh, so back. Uh, <laughs> they, I, I went to like their commissioning ceremony in Atlanta, and uh, all of that as, as little children my sister and I did and so my dad had left uh, practicing medicine and ended up kind of becoming a uh, consultant slash medical missionary for the entire United States Uh, and so he would travel along with my mom and do all sorts of things between helping churches start clinics and find ways to serve those that were uh, in need of medical care and uh, also did some AIDS education because of course back at that time there were a Mm -hmm. lot of folks that were terrified as to what it meant, what AIDS meant, uh, what it meant to have somebody maybe who was HIV positive in their congregation um, and and just do a lot of education on that front. And it's one thing to hear it from the news or from uh, a pastor, but I think there was some uh, level of 
uh, kind of reassurance that congregations felt from hearing a doctor explain, hey, look, it's okay. If somebody has AIDS and comes into your church, uh, welcome them, give them a hug, right? So um, they are God's children, and uh, and this is the reason why uh, you should welcome them as well. So he kind of did a, a huge uh a large diversity of things uh, for the home mission board back in the day. Okay. So after you became a follower of Christ, you're, you're young and you weren't entirely sure what, what it meant, but you were pretty sure at the time you knew what it meant. Where did following Jesus take you from that point? You know, you're, you're young, six, seven years old and, <laughs> and you're starting out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I would, I would go back to what my parents taught me right uh, i would say in, in uh, that that god and following jesus had a lot more to do with what you do outside of church than it ever do, mm. does uh, with going to church right uh so uh for my family if if we weren't doing something at the church and by doing something i don't necessarily mean going to a church service or sunday school even but really uh, giving back, whether that's taking food to folks or uh, delivering some sort of service, um, working with children. If we weren't doing those things, we weren't following Christ. And and I think that's sort of the path that I went on, even even in high school. I remember in high school, uh, I, I uh, even though my dad was my Sunday school teacher, I was so tired of Sunday school. I was like, I got to do something <laughs> else. <laughs> I, you know, I felt like, hey, I've heard enough Sunday school lessons, right, at 16 and 17. So then I was like, Dad, yeah, so I really like your Sunday school class, but I'm going to go teach the five-year-olds uh, Sunday school because uh, that just felt more uh, like what I wanted to do. So, uh, so I was still in Sunday school, but I got to do more coloring at that point in time. But I also got to do more service, right? So uh, I think for me that that was what church was, uh, was not sitting still. Um, in fact, even my wife still to this day, uh, when we go to church, she's, she's like, Jesse, why can't you sit still? And she yeah. knows as well as I, I remember that, that about I, you. Uh -huh. Yeah. I've never sat yeah. still. So, uh, yeah, it's not really my thing. So, yeah. So I would say, uh, sitting in the church pew is, is probably one of my least favorite parts of going to church. Um, uh, but I, I do love, being in church with with other folks serving we're going to take a sponsor break and we'll be right back since 1952 south texas children's home ministries has focused on healing hearts and sharing hope their nine ministries focus on helping hurting children and families all regardless of an individual's ability to pay to find out more visit www.stchm.org you said that following Jesus is a lot more about what you do outside of the four walls of the church than necessarily what you do inside the four walls. So when you were in high school, you were a wrestler. Uh, when you came to UNM, you were studying political science and uh, Spanish, right? That's right. Yeah. And from what I recall, you you were almost fluent in Spanish. I mean, you, you did pretty well. Uh, so how did that kind of thing factor into, or I guess, how did you pair uh, following Jesus, serving the church, and uh, the things that you were doing outside of church? Yeah, I, I mean, so well, one thing from the, speaking of growing up, right, uh, so one of the reasons I wanted to learn Spanish, uh, for me at least, uh, was as I was growing up, my parents intentionally, we I went to school, my sister and I, um, that was a really diverse school. We had students from everywhere where uh, being uh, monolingual was probably more unique than being bilingual. Uh, so we had students from uh, all over Latin America, uh, a lot of Vietnamese and Laotian students, and uh, yeah, just a, a great diversity of, of students. And so I remembered uh, being on the high school soccer team and uh, there was uh, my senior year, I think there was uh, myself and then another uh, one other uh, white guy. And we were the, uh, the only ones who didn't speak two languages. Right. Uh, so everybody else either spoke Spanish and English or Vietnamese and, and English or uh, Laotian and English or what have you. And, and I think for me, it was uh, important to understand that, hey, uh, if, if you really want to reach folks, you got to learn how to uh, speak their language. And that's in a very literal sense. Um, so I won't lie, my Spanish has dropped off in my years of lawyering sense, but uh, but it is something that I could pick back up. And, and I think there's such value to that 
is uh, finding ways to serve folks in their language and understanding that, hey, when you speak a mother tongue to someone, you're speaking to their heart in a different way, um, yeah. right? So um, in an adopted language is a whole different thing. And now, now that I'm married to my wife, she speaks multiple languages, and I'm even further aware of, of what it means to speak to someone's heart, um, right, in that sense. And, and so I would say, like, continue to figure out how to, to serve and, and, and speak someone's language within that space has been uh, something that's been uh, important to me because I see how, the difference it makes when uh, someone's eyes brighten up and uh, uh, they, yep. they hear their own language, right? So, yeah. There's a connection too. Yeah. Uh, are you learning any of the languages that your wife speaks? Uh, well, much to her is she chagrin. Teaching you? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that assumes I'm teachable, right? So. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Well, hey. Uh, yeah, I would say uh, I I have enough phrases to get myself into. I don't know that I have enough phrases to get myself out of trouble, but uh, but I definitely have enough phrases to get myself into trouble. So. Uh, yeah, it's 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 been a journey. Well, you do so, that in English uh, anyway, so it's it's funny yeah. how that works, isn't it? So yeah, uh, yeah. It, mu multilingual troublemaker, I think, is probably what she would call me. So, but yeah, um, luck luckily, luckily, uh, a little bit of language can go a long ways as long as it comes from a place of sincerity. I think. So. Okay. Okay. All right. We'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> when you were at UNM studying political science, how did you come to that? degree and and what were you envisioning yourself doing with that oh that's so that's a good question and the answer is probably i don't know on both fronts really okay. um, i i think it was that reality where i went to school and thought well maybe i should be a doctor like my dad and then i thought mm. wow he must have done a lot more studying than i've done um in life <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah i think political science was something that was interesting because i think what it showed was how political systems and how we as a society make choices and particularly choices uh, for for those that are the poor amongst among us. Right. So mm -hmm. um, how do we as a society, as a political system, figure out ways to help others? Right. Um, and how do we do that systemically as opposed to, you know, I mean, I, I think it was always important. I always think it's important for us to give and serve and find ways to um certainly uh, invite the poor into our hearts and into our lives. But I think how do we change systems that create oppression and how do we change those systems that, that um, are, are keeping folks where they are as opposed to uh, helping bring them along to, uh, to the greater good. Um, and so I think I always found that interesting how uh, societies, uh, politicians, how uh, citizens make those choices and why. Um, and so that was one thing I just found really curious kind of academically. And, and, and of course, I still do. Um, and the question is, how do you create positive change really for those that are hungry and those that are poor, um, those that are in need um, and those that are homeless? Yeah. And political science and, and uh, things that you were involved in at, at UNM, they brought you face to face with that on a pretty regular basis. I mean, our, our building, the Baptist Student Union building, where it was located, we had uh, a lot of uh, interesting relationships with uh, people that, you know, lived around our building and uh, slept in the bushes and things like that. Uh, uh, one time, I think my uh, I went with another group. There's maybe two or three other guys and we were giving sandwiches out. And we started praying with uh, some other men that were living on the streets. And mm -hmm. uh, we were probably out there. To, I, it seemed like much later than my normal bedtime. And um, <laughs> oh, okay. you, you were, I'm trying you were to think waiting, what that was. Yeah. Yeah. And you were okay. waiting for us in the parking lot at First Baptist Church down there in downtown Albuquerque, where we had started to begin with, because you were wanting to make sure we got back safely and things like that. And uh, yeah, those are those experiences I remember. And I remember like being part of like what that meant to uh to be the uh the hands and the the hearts and the uh of jesus right so and the fact that we were doing that but you wanted to stand by us and making sure that we were still there and and supporting us throughout that so yeah those are things i remember as far as what it meant to serve jesus in that way in albuquerque yeah yeah those were good days <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah we have a lot of stories about that i'm glad you didn't uh tell all of them <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> well I, yeah. it, it is yeah, yeah I, for posterity's sake i'll stop there 
Okay, okay. We'll just leave everybody guessing. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. We'll stay tuned maybe for the next episode of your podcast. So. Yeah, maybe so. Well, from UNM, you went to Fordham and uh, you studied law. Yeah. Well, so uh, right after UNM, I went to, to, New, to New York to, to work. Uh, I worked with a Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, partnered with them um, through uh, and ended up serving for two years with their uh, Global Service Corps. Uh, at Metro Baptist Church and Rauschenbusch Metro Ministries, uh, doing services. Basically, I, I helped run uh, English as second language programs and uh, uh, youth programs at that little nonprofit in in Hell's Kitchen in New York. So I did that for a couple of years, and, there, and then decided had a little bit hey, of snow there one winter. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, uh, it's New York, right? So it's, it's yeah. it, it was it. Was, I, I will say that there was a huge difference, right? I thought, hey, look, I uh, we I'd, I'd grown up in a family doing urban ministry in Oklahoma City and then Albuquerque, and I was like, yeah, I'm ready for New York. And I was, yeah, I would say those were those buildings are tall. Um, so and there's a lot of people in New York, so it was a cultural shift for sure. So yeah, uh, yeah, and snow and gray, and especially coming from Albuquerque where it's just sunny all the time. So yeah, so that was a huge shift. Uh, less on the service front, and almost more on the uh, weather <laughs> and culture front. So yeah. Yeah, man. I just remember you sending pictures of uh, a snow storm one winter, and I think it was taller. The snow was taller than you, I think. Yeah, anyway. it was, yeah it was a whole different ball game out there than, uh, than yeah. what I was used to. We're going to take a 60 second sponsor break, and we'll be right back. High Ground Advisors has a 90 year history of providing investment management and planned giving solutions to churches faith-based organizations, and charitably-minded individuals dedicated to transforming lives. High Ground is trusted by over 450 nonprofit clients, and we're one of them. High Ground has partnered with Baptist Standard for over 70 years by offering a comprehensive charitable giving and investment solutions model, which includes asset management, planned giving education and development, account support services, real estate and minerals management, and expert legal consultation. High Ground and the Baptist Standard share similar values, such as serving those who are called and dedicated to transforming lives and being a trusted caretaker of legacies. They also value good stewardship, helping those who desire to be good stewards of their financial resources to find creative giving solutions to fulfill that calling. They know what they do to protect, strengthen, and grow our mission is ultimately in service to the gospel. To learn more about how High Ground Advisors can partner with you or your organization, visit their website at highgroundadvisors.org. Well, you studied um, poverty law at Fordham. And you know I think about that, and not just anybody wants to study poverty law. So based on the things that you've described to this point, um, people might be able to think, okay, all right, that, that seems to make sense for you. Uh, what else was factoring into a decision to study that? Well, so yeah, so I mean, in, basically in law school, right, you don't really have a, a specialty so much, but yeah, I definitely took classes, right? So looking at how poverty influences um, uh, basically the law and, and how the law influences those that are impoverished. And one of the things that I came out of law school realizing, and this is through internships and obviously my previous work experiences, the difference housing makes for people, right? Mm. So um, that it really doesn't matter. And, and how much the legal systems kind of support, unfortunately, not just the legal, but the political systems uh, kind of help support and continue to perpetuate um, chronic homelessness and other issues like that. And um and that's what really kind of got me going in life that uh, no matter what, no matter who you are, uh, in fact, I would argue no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, reducing homelessness should be a goal for everybody. Um, it's better for us as Christians. Uh, that's, you know, hitting home to begin with. But even if you're not a Christian from a political standpoint, from a socioeconomic standpoint, it's better for us as a society. Um, so, but yeah, I think for me, it was really 
the fight against homelessness and the fight for safe and sustainable housing for other folks was really what started to drive me. And that was through obviously my previous experiences, um, but then also working in housing court in New York City and uh, doing tenants rights things, uh, realizing mm. that folks were just living on the margins uh, in so many ways. And, and we need to figure out a way as kind of as, as humans, right? Uh, and more particularly as Christians to to find ways to give folks a place to lay their head at night, right? Even Jesus talked about being homeless, right? Uh, about yeah. he hit, how he had no place to lay his head. Uh, and if we're supposed to serve Jesus, I think that means we need to figure out ways to serve the homeless. Mm. And when you finished, you ended up in Denver. Yeah, so I worked at, uh, I got a job out of law school trying to figure out what to do uh, when I grew up. And uh, I think uh, my wife and I, we, uh, at least I, I will speak for myself, uh, I was a little tired of living on the East Coast uh, and needed some sunshine. And uh, yeah, I got a job at the uh, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and uh, as, as a lawyer. So I worked in their office of counsel for, for many years and uh, doing all sorts of manners of programs. Of course, HUD is this kind of a agency where they put an amalgamation of, of a variety of programs to, uh, to, for social services and for housing and community development. So I ended up working there, uh, doing, doing a lot of really kind of interesting work for a while, uh, which I, which I definitely enjoyed. Um, and, and I, cause I, I found that it was important work, uh, for sure. So. Okay. While you were at HUD in Denver, uh, where did you find your Christian convictions being able to be expressed through the work that you were doing? Yeah. So, I mean, to me, I think, again, and going back to my ideas before, is it, it really doesn't matter who you are or where you come from. Uh, the more housing uh, we can provide for humanity, the more we are fulfilling our call as Christians. Um, mm. So, and because it really doesn't, again, especially when you're looking at who is homeless and why folks are homeless. Um, and, and one of the things I think that that fueled me was especially HUD's programs that that were kind of more integrated, right? So um, doing stuff where it was not just uh, housing, but providing supportive care as well. Because anybody who's worked with the homeless for long understands that a lot of the folks that live on the streets, the reason they're on the streets isn't necessarily because they've chosen to be on the streets. It could be a wide variety of things, and many of whom are struggling with mental illness and other psychiatric disorders. And I think it's a full picture of services that we need, especially coming from a family where my dad was a doctor, realizing that folks that are homeless uh, are not just experiencing housing instability, they're also experiencing mm -hmm. severe medical problems, right? That's a physical, mm -hmm. right. psychiatric, uh, uh, a wide variety of things. And, and the more we can do to help folks in that full spectrum of uh, services, the better we can do uh, as society and, and really as Christians. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, homelessness is a cluster of things, and it's it can be causative or it can be uh, an outcome. Absolutely, absolutely, right. And and the question is, what what can we do to help alleviate um, the suffering of others? Right. So, um, I, I think it's always important to remember, right? We all remember the Good Samaritan, but I think the question really that 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 was answering was who is my neighbor right and the answer is the folks who you don't expect to be your neighbor uh, right uh, so yeah. and 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 i think that's the challenge for us and if we're not challenged by that if we don't have neighbors that challenge us and we're not challenging ourselves to serve someone different than ourselves then i wonder if we're fulfilling our call as as christians mm. Mm. on that front homelessness and, and finding homes for people. Uh, where are Christians getting it right? Where, where are you seeing some good work being done? Yeah, I, I think, I think anytime we are, uh, uh, loving folks, right. So we're doing something well, uh, right. Where we are, uh, we're giving, giving to someone, uh, who doesn't need something. I, I, I mean, I, who, or who maybe doesn't, in a better way, doesn't, quote, deserve it, right, by our standards, by our societal standards. So I think anytime you've seen a, a church uh, give to someone who, who's in need, uh, that, that's uh, 
would not otherwise have received that you're stepping into the shoes of Jesus at that point in time. So um, I think there are lots of folks I know throughout this country, throughout this world uh, who are making a difference. I remember my, my uncle Brent, he was a pastor in Glen Rose, Texas for many, yeah. many years. He's, he's yep. passed now. Um, but when I think of him and I think about like what he did at his church in Glen Rose, he would go down to Juarez, Mexico on a regular basis and, and feed the children. Right. Uh, he, he was someone who lived voraciously, uh, for Christ. And, uh, and I know he was a, uh, he was a uh, dedicated Texas Baptist to be sure. Um, uh, but he also really wanted to fulfill the call of Christ, uh, through his service. And, uh, and I think he, he loved God by loving others in that way. Um, because I think so often we think that Jesus, Jesus is held in our mouths, but I think we, uh, communicate Jesus with our hands more so. And I, th- and I think my uncle Brent often was able to do that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Your uncle was a pretty great guy. Um, just to, as an aside, he, he and my father-in-law knew each other when my father-in-law was a uh, pastor just up the road from him. And, and then my father-in-law became the director of missions. Yeah. So uh, small world. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's it. That's it. Yeah. So I would assume that there are right ways, uh, beneficial ways to uh-huh. help those in need, like those who are looking for housing, need housing. And there are wrong ways or, um, or problematic ways um, to quote unquote help. So um, what is, what's an example of something that you've seen in your work in law and, and now uh, you're in real estate um, that you would characterize as a problematic way to, um, to help someone uh, in need or someone who needs housing? Yeah, I mean, uh, so one thing I, I've, <laughs> I've thought about, uh, and, and this is something that happens uh, in many communities, in fact, it has a name, right? So NIMBYism, right? So it's, it's not in my backyard uh, kind of idea. I think uh, particularly what I've seen is, is too often with Christians, it's that idea of like, yeah, hey, we, we really believe that this affordable housing should be built uh, or that this supportive housing for the homeless should be built, but it shouldn't be built in my neighborhood. Um, mm. mm-hmm. And I think we see that politically kind of come to fruition a lot, but it also happens in the Christian world a lot, um, where it's sort of like, hey, these folks, yeah, they should come to church, but they should sit over there, um, right? Or they, uh, they, they, don't, they don't quite smell in this way. In fact, that's one of the things I, yeah. I think about is, is the question is, if everybody looks like you, if everybody smells like you, if everybody talks like you in church, I don't know that we're fulfilling the kingdom of God in that sense. Um, so, and, and part of that is being active, um, figuring out a way to, Hey, actually it's not, uh, not in my backyard. When are we going to come to the point as Christians to say yes in my backyard? Right. So, uh, Hey, how do we as Christians, um, build affordable housing? In fact, uh, we're blessed right now. Uh, my wife and I, we, we go to, a uh, uh, an African Methodist Episcopal church now, um, not a, not a Baptist church anymore. Um, but the church we go to actually built affordable housing years and years ago. Uh, mm. in fact, it was, a uh, it received some, uh, HUD subsidies and oversights and things like okay. that. Uh, and, it, and, uh, and it's a church that said, Hey, you know what? We are going to not just invite folks to church. We want to build a place for them to live. Um, and it's one of the things that makes me so happy. And it's a tiny little church that's still there. And uh, they built this housing and they have a whole housing corporation that runs this affordable housing for a little community right across the street from our church in, in Denver, Colorado. And I think churches that are doing that, building that housing, but not just building housing for folks who they like or for folks who um, already come to the church, but really for folks who are in need. I think that's the kind of housing, that's the kind of support that we need as communities and across the board. And how do we do that in our own backyard and advocate for that? Um, and so figuring out how to do that and move forward, I think is super important. Um, and, and I think conversely, right? So when you talk about things that we don't do well, again, I think it's that idea of, hey, yeah, we should advocate, but we should advocate for somebody else to do it. 
right? Um, so one of the things I, I remember uh, growing up where it's, uh, y- you don't sit around and wait for the chairs to be put away after the church service or, uh, you know, in the fellowship hall, you have to help do it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, and I think that's part of it, right? It's every little act of service we can do. Um, and that uh, kind of goes the spectrum. I think too often we think, okay, hey, if I give... Um, if I donate to this organization or I tithe, that's enough. I, I think tithing has always encompassed a lot more than than our wallets, uh, right? So how, how do we actually go and volunteer and help feed the homeless um, and whatever that means? And, and then I also think we also need to engage with our um, political and social systems as well, right? Um, mm, so okay. we sit here and we pretend as though um, – as people, that's all you have to do. You, you donate. Um, maybe you volunteer for a little bit. I think you have to realize, like, and challenge the structures that exist that that have created homelessness, right? So, folks that are mentally ill on the street. Why is that happening? Why is that happening in our society? Why can't we find a way to fund the services that those folks need to find the housing they need? Um, so, I think it's a multi-pronged uh, what to do and, and how to do it. Yeah same time yeah yeah because another thing too is is that poverty very rarely is something that happens all of a sudden it for many people maybe for the majority of people who are in poverty uh, this is something that's maybe even been generational or uh, maybe it is a life choice at some point along the way but that life choice is not uh, sort of divorced from other factors that were going on But at any rate, however a person finds themselves uh, in a position of being in uh, poverty, it wasn't something that just necessarily happened overnight in most cases. And so it would seem to me that there is plenty of opportunity for uh, churches, for Christians, uh, for lots of different people, Christian or not, to be engaged in some way along that road regardless of what a person's uh, political leanings are, uh, there, there's opportunity uh, for, for everyone to be a part of, well, to use a phrase, fixing the problem. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, I think if we go back to the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan didn't come across the guy and be like, well, you should have been on this road to begin with. It was dangerous. Uh, you should have known better, right? I think... Uh, what Jesus is teaching us is it doesn't matter why they got on the road they got on. Um, if they're hurting and suffering, it's our job to help our neighbor. Yeah. Yeah. And the Good Samaritan, then when he decided to help the guy, uh, he put himself out. I mean, he, you know, he picked the guy up. He didn't just throw some money down and say, you know, when the food truck comes by, you can get something. <laughs> Uh, but he, you know, he, he put himself really at risk. Uh, he was going to end up slowing himself down, uh, to get this guy somewhere where he could get some help, which would, uh, you know, make him a target too. Uh, he, he gets this guy to a place where he can lay his head and be sheltered and reasonably safe. And, and he, he doesn't stop there. He comes back, you know, he says, I'll be back. Uh, to make sure you know everything is as it's supposed to be. Of course, we're paraphrasing a little bit, but uh, it seems to me that uh, the kind of work that that you've been doing for quite a while now, that your your family's been a part of, and and that you're talking about, this is not a one and done kind of thing. This is a, this is this for a lot of people. This is a life of uh, well, maybe. It ought to be for all of us. I don't know, but it's a life of being engaged um, where the hurt is and where the need is. Is that saying too much? No, I, I wouldn't say that. I, I think, uh, uh, as Jesus pointed out, the poor will always be amongst us, right? So uh, yeah. that, I think that means that the struggle will always continue. Um, uh, I wish Jesus wasn't so pessimistic about that, you know? 
Yeah, well, Never. you know, uh, uh, it's, <laughs> Right, we can, right. we can, I, I'll, I'll, we, we need to let it know. Hey, I, I think uh, maybe maybe realistic is probably the better way to okay, put it, okay, right? So, right. Uh, g- give it, given given the state of, of of humanity, right? So, there's no yeah. question. Yeah, I mean, I I think that's the reality, which is I'm, a, and you know, I think my own faith has struggled with that, which is like mm. uh, how, yeah, frankly, to be completely honest, is like how dare God allow this to happen or create mm. a a, a, a uh, or make a creation that can make these choices about each other right so yeah. uh it makes okay. it makes it really tough for me as a christian to move forward because i'm like that doesn't seem fair right and uh mm-hmm. you know we assume that god knows all things at all times and all these things that we've been taught and it just seems like well that's not a great system that you created god um, so and, and and i understand right we have choices and things like that but i was like we could have what i think reducing some of these choices would have made sense and that's always been a face struggle for me for sure mm. yeah that's a tough that's a tough one i mean really yeah yeah no it's 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 really tough i think especially when you look and you think well wait a second this why is it why is it this way why do we have these choices even um and sure i i understand what what i was taught in sunday school and uh by reading the word and things like that but uh at some level i think i don't know <laughs> maybe i would have picked a different <laughs> system but maybe that's my lawyerly nature i'm not sure mm. which but uh, mm. yeah 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 well as we come to the end um as you look forward, look ahead, um, maybe in the near future, uh, what's something hopeful that you see for this kind of work? I think I think we are hopefully becoming more aware of what mm-hmm. it means to to serve folks. Uh, that are experiencing homelessness and housing instability and understanding that it's, it's more than just one response, right? There's no, uh, we are in the times of, uh, I don't know when the, the podcast will play, but uh, we're in the t- times of the uh, coronavirus, right? COVID-19 uh, vaccine. There's no vaccine, unfortunately, for homelessness, right? Yeah. So yeah. it is, it is a full systemic, right, issue uh, that involves us personally. And, but I think we are becoming aware that, uh, there's not one government program that solves it, right? Nor is there one charitable donation that solves it. Uh, it's got to be a, a, a decision by each one of us, and yet a decision for us as a society to, to make the difference um, and to really help those that are that are struggling in this world. And uh, and I hope that um, we can all be a part of the struggle for uh, housing as opposed to uh, you know judgment or uh, mm. decision making for other folks. Jesse, thank you for spending this time with me. Thank you so much for having me. It's just good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you too. Just because a person follows Jesus doesn't mean that person is perfect. Following Jesus is a lifetime of growing more like him. Likewise, while there are followers who are more mature than others, who have spent more time growing close to Jesus than other followers, there are no followers of Jesus who are better than others. If you aren't on the way with Jesus, we invite you to check out the Follow Jesus page on the Baptist Standard website at baptiststandard.com forward slash follow Jesus to learn more about becoming a follower of Him. If you are on the way with Jesus, we hope that this podcast has encouraged you to grow more like Him. I'm Eric Black, editor of the Baptist Standard, and I'm glad you've been with us today.